The Insanity of Jones A Study in Reincarnation by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Sames The Insanity of Jones A Study in Reincarnation by Algernon Blackwood Adventures come to the adventurous and mysterious things fall in the way of those who, with wonder and imagination, are on the watch for them. But the majority of people go past the doors that are left half ajar, thinking them closed, and fail to notice the faint stirrings of the great curtain that hangs ever in the form of appearances between them and the world of causes behind. For only to the few whose inner senses have been quickened, perchance by some strange suffering in the depths, or by a natural temperament bequeathed from a remote past, comes the knowledge, not too welcome, that this greater world lies ever at their elbow, and that any moment a chance combination of moods and forces may invite them to cross the shifting frontier. Some, however, are born with this awful certainty in their hearts, and are called to no apprenticeship, and to this select company Jones undoubtedly belonged. All his life he had realized that his senses brought to him merely a more or less interesting set of sham appearances, that space as men measure it was utterly misleading, that time as the clock ticked it in a succession of minutes was arbitrary nonsense, and in fact that all his sensory perceptions were but a clumsy representation of real things behind the curtain, things he was forever trying to get at, and that sometimes he actually did get at. He had always been tremblingly aware that he stood on the borderland of another region, a region where time and space were merely forms of thought, where ancient memories lay open to the sight, and where the forces behind each human life stood plainly revealed, and he could see the hidden springs at the very heart of the world. Moreover, the fact that he was a clerk in a fire insurance office and did his work with strict attention never allowed him to forget for one moment that, just beyond the dingy brick walls, where the hundred men scribbled with pointed pens beneath the electric lamps, there existed this glorious region, where the important part of himself dwelt and moved and had its being. For in this region he pictured himself playing the part of a spectator to his ordinary workaday life watching like a king the stream of events, but untouched in his own soul by the dirt, the noise, and the vulgar commotion of the outer world. And this was no poetic dream merely. Jones was not playing prettily with idealism to amuse himself. It was a living, working belief. So convinced was he that the external world was the result of a vast deception, practised upon him by the gross senses, that when he stared at a great building like St. Paul's, he felt it would not very much surprise him to see it suddenly quiver like a shape of jelly, and then melt utterly away, while in its place stood all at once revealed the mass of colour, or the great intricate vibrations, or the splendid sound, the spiritual idea which it represented in stone. For something in this way it was that his mind worked, yet to all appearances and in the satisfaction of all business claims, Jones was normal and unenterprising. He felt nothing but contempt for the wave of modern psychism. He hardly knew the meaning of such words as clairvoyance and clairaudience. He had never felt the least desire to join the Theosophical Society and to speculate in theories of astral plane life or elementals. He attended no meetings of the Psychical Research Society and knew no anxiety as to whether his aura was black or blue. Nor was he conscious of the slightest wish to mix in with the revival of cheap occultism, which proved so attractive to weak minds of mystical tendencies and unleashed imaginations. There were certain things he knew, but none he cared to argue about, and he shrank instinctively from attempting to put names to the contents of this other region knowing well that such names could only limit and define things that, according to any standards in use in the ordinary world, were simply undefinable and elusive. 
so that although this was the way his mind worked, there was clearly a very strong leaven of common sense in Jones. In a word, the man the world and the office knew as Jones was Jones. The name summed him up and labelled him correctly. John Enderby Jones. Among the things that he knew, and therefore never cared to speak or speculate about, one was that he plainly saw himself as the inheritor of a long series of past lives, the net result of painful evolution, always as himself, of course, but in numerous different bodies, each determined by the behaviour of the preceding one. The present John Jones was the last result to date of all the previous thinking, feeling, and doing of John Jones in earlier bodies and in other centuries. He pretended to no details, nor claimed distinguished ancestry, for he realised his past must have been utterly commonplace and insignificant to have produced his present. But he was just as sure he had been at this weary game for ages as that he breathed, and it never occurred to him to argue, to doubt, or to ask questions. And one result of this belief was that his thoughts dwelt upon the past rather than upon the future, that he read much history, and felt specially drawn to certain periods whose spirit he understood instinctively, as though he had lived in them, and that he found all religions uninteresting, because, almost without exception, they start from the present and speculate ahead as to what men shall become, instead of looking back and speculating why men have got here as they are. In the insurance office he did his work exceedingly well, but without much personal ambition. Men and women he regarded as the impersonal instruments for inflicting upon him the pain or pleasure he had earned by his past workings, for chance had no place in his scheme of things at all. And while he recognised that the practical world could not get along unless every man did his work thoroughly and conscientiously, he took no interest in the accumulation of fame or money for himself, and simply, therefore, did his plain duty with indifference as to results. In common with others who lead a strictly impersonal life, he possessed the quality of utter bravery, and was always ready to face any combination of circumstances, no matter how terrible, because he saw in them the just working out of past causes he had himself set in motion, which could not be dodged or modified. And whereas the majority of people had little meaning for him, either by way of attraction or repulsion, the moment he met someone with whom he felt his past had been vitally interwoven, his whole inner being leapt up instantly and shouted the fact in his face, and he regulated his life with the utmost skill and caution, like a sentry on watch for an enemy whose feet could already be heard approaching. Thus, while the great majority of men and women left him uninfluenced, since he regarded them as so many souls merely passing with him along the great stream of evolution, there were, here and there, individuals with whom he recognised that his smallest intercourse was of the gravest importance. These were persons with whom he knew in every fibre of his being he had accounts to settle, pleasant or otherwise, arising out of dealings in past lives, and into his relations with these few, therefore. He concentrated, as it were, the efforts that most people spread over their intercourse with a far greater number. By what means he picked out these few individuals, only those conversant with the startling process of the subconscious memory may say. But the point was that Jones believed the main purpose, if not quite the entire purpose, of his present incarnation lay in his faithful and thorough settling of these accounts, and that if he sought to evade the least detail of such settling, no matter how unpleasant, he would have lived in vain, and would return to his next incarnation with this added duty to perform. For according to his beliefs there was no chance, and could be no ultimate shirking, and to avoid a problem was merely to waste time and lose opportunities for development. And there was one individual with whom Jones had long understood clearly he had a very large account to settle, and towards the accomplishment of which all the main currents of his being seemed to bear him with unswerving purpose. For when he first entered the insurance office as a junior clerk ten years before, 
and through a glass door had caught sight of this man seated in an inner room. One of his sudden overwhelming flashes of intuitive memory had burst up into him from the depths, and he had seen, as in a flame of blinding light, a symbolical picture of the future rising out of a dreadful past, and he had, without any act of definite volition, marked down this man for a real account to be settled. With that man I shall have much to do, he said to himself, as he noted the big face look up and meet his eyes through the glass. There is something I cannot shirk, a vital relation out of the past of both of us, and he went to his desk trembling a little, and with shaking knees, as though the memory of some terrible pain had suddenly laid its icy hand upon his heart, and touched the scar of a great horror. It was a moment of genuine terror when their eyes had met through the glass door, and he was conscious of an inward shrinking and loathing that seized upon him with a great violence, and convinced him in a single second that the settling of this account would be almost, perhaps, more than he could manage. The vision passed as swiftly as it came, dropping back again into the submerged region of his consciousness. But he never forgot it, and the whole of his life thereafter became a sort of natural though undeliberate preparation for the fulfilment of the great duty when the time should be ripe. In those days, ten years ago, this man was the assistant manager, but had since been promoted as manager to one of the company's local branches, and soon afterwards Jones had likewise found himself transferred to this same branch. A little later again, the branch at Liverpool, one of the most important, had been in peril owing to mismanagement and defalcation, and the man had gone to take charge of it, and again, by mere chance apparently, Jones had been promoted to the same place. And this pursuit of the assistant manager had continued for several years, often too in the most curious fashion, and though Jones had never exchanged a single word with him, or been so much as noticed indeed by the great man, the clerk understood perfectly well that these moves in the game were all part of a definite purpose. Never for one moment did he doubt that the invisibles behind the veil were slowly and surely arranging the details of it all, so as to lead up suitably to the climax demanded by justice, a climax in which himself and the manager would play the leading roles. It is inevitable, he said to himself, and I feel it may be terrible, but when the moment comes I shall be ready, and I pray God that I may face it properly and act like a man. Moreover, as the years passed and nothing happened, he felt the horror closing in upon him with steady increase, for the fact was Jones hated and loathed the manager with an intensity of feeling he had never before experienced towards any human being. He shrank from his presence, and from the glance of his eyes, as though he remembered to have suffered nameless cruelties at his hands, and he slowly began to realise, moreover, that the matter to be settled between them was one of very ancient standing, and that the nature of the settlement was a discharge of accumulated punishment which would probably be very dreadful in the manner of its fulfilment. When, therefore, the chief cashier one day informed him that the man was to be in London again, this time as general manager of the head office, and said that he was charged to find a private secretary for him from among the best clerks, and further intimated that the selection had fallen upon himself, Jones accepted the promotion quietly, fatalistically, yet with a degree of inward loathing hardly to be described, for he saw in this merely another move in the evolution of the inevitable nemesis, which he simply dared not seek to frustrate by any personal consideration, and at the same time he was conscious of a certain feeling of relief, that the suspense of waiting might soon be mitigated. A secret sense of satisfaction, therefore, accompanied the unpleasant change, and Jones was able to hold himself perfectly well in hand when it was carried into effect and he was formally introduced as private secretary to the general manager. Now the manager was a large, fat man, with a very red face and bags beneath his eyes. 
Being short-sighted, he wore glasses that seemed to magnify his eyes, which were always a little bloodshot. In hot weather, a sort of thin slime covered his cheeks, for he perspired easily. His head was almost entirely bald, and over his turned-down collar his great neck folded in two distinct reddish collops of flesh. His hands were big, and his fingers almost massive in thickness. He was an excellent businessman, of sane judgment and firm will, without enough imagination to confuse his course of action by showing him possible alternatives, and his integrity and ability caused him to be held in universal respect by the world of business and finance. In the important regions of a man's character, however, and at heart, he was coarse, brutal almost to savagery, without consideration for others, and as a result often cruelly unjust to his helpless subordinates. In moments of temper, which were not infrequent, his face turned a dull purple, while the top of his bald head shone by contrast like white marble, and the bags under his eyes swelled till it seemed they would presently explode with a pop, and at these times he presented a distinctly repulsive appearance. But to a private secretary like Jones, who did his duty regardless of whether his employer was beast or angel, and whose mainspring was principle and not emotion, this made little difference. Within the narrow limits in which any one could satisfy such a man, he pleased the general manager, and more than once his piercing intuitive faculty amounting almost to clairvoyance, assisted the chief in a fashion that served to bring the two closer together than might otherwise have been the case, and caused the man to respect in his assistant a power of which he possessed not even the germ himself. It was a curious relationship that grew up between the two, and the cashier who enjoyed the credit of having made the selection profited by it indirectly as much as anyone else. So for some time the work of the office continued normally and very prosperously. John Enderby Jones received a good salary, and in the outward appearance of the two chief characters in this history there was little change noticeable, except that the manager grew fatter and redder, and the secretary observed that his own hair was beginning to show rather greyish at the temples. There were, however, two changes in progress and they both had to do with Jones, and are important to mention. One was that he began to dream evilly. In the region of deep sleep, where the possibility of significant dreaming first develops itself, he was tormented more and more with vivid scenes and pictures, in which a tall, thin man, dark and sinister of countenance, and with bad eyes, was closely associated with himself. Only the setting was that of a past age, with costumes of centuries gone by, and the scenes had to do with dreadful cruelties that could not belong to modern life as he knew it. The other change was also significant, but is not so easy to describe, for he had in fact become aware that some new portion of himself, hitherto unawakened, had stirred slowly into life out of the very depths of his consciousness. This new part of himself amounted almost to another personality, and he never observed its least manifestation without a strange thrill at his heart, for he understood that it had begun to watch the manager. It was the habit of Jones, since he was compelled to work among conditions that were utterly distasteful, to withdraw his mind wholly from business once the day was over. During office hours he kept the strictest possible watch upon himself, and turned the key on all inner dreams, lest any sudden uprush from the deeps should interfere with his duty. But once the working day was over, the gates flew open, and he began to enjoy himself. He read no modern books on the subjects that interested him, and, as already said, he followed no course of training, nor belonged to any society that dabbled with half-told mysteries. But... Once released from the office desk in the manager's room, he simply and naturally entered the other region, because he was an old inhabitant, a rightful denizen, and because he belonged there. It was, in fact, really a case of dual personality, and a carefully drawn agreement existed between 
Jones of the Fire Insurance Office, and Jones of the Mysteries, by the terms of which, under heavy penalties, neither region claimed him out of hours. For the moment he reached his rooms under the roof in Bloomsbury, and had changed his city coat to another. The iron doors of the office clanged far behind him, and in front, before his very eyes, rolled up the beautiful gates of ivory, and he entered into places of flowers and singing and wonderful veiled forms. Sometimes he quite lost touch with the outer world, forgetting to eat his dinner or go to bed, and lay in a state of trance, his consciousness working far out of the body. And on other occasions he walked the streets on air, halfway between the two regions, unable to distinguish between incarnate and discarnate forms, and not very far, probably, beyond the strata where poets, saints, and the greatest artists have moved and thought, and found their inspiration. But this was only when some insistent bodily claim prevented his full release, and more often than not he was entirely independent of his physical portion, and free of the real region, without let or hindrance. One evening he reached home utterly exhausted after the burden of a day's work. The manager had been more than usually brutal, unjust, ill-tempered, and Jones had been almost persuaded out of his settled policy of contempt into answering back. Everything seemed to have gone amiss, and the man's coarse, underbred nature had been in the ascendant all day long. He had thumped the desk with his great fists, abused, found fault unreasonably, uttered outrageous things, and behaved generally as he actually was beneath the thin veneer of acquired business varnish. He had done and said everything to wound all that was woundable in an ordinary secretary, and though Jones fortunately dwelt in a region from which he looked down upon such a man, as he might look down upon the blundering of a savage animal, the strain had nevertheless told severely upon him, and he reached home, wondering for the first time in his life whether there was perhaps a point beyond which he would be unable to restrain himself any longer. For something out of the usual had happened. At the close of a passage of great stress between the two, every nerve in the secretary's body tingling from undeserved abuse, the manager had suddenly turned full upon him in the corner of the private room where the safe stood, in such a way that the glare of his red eyes, magnified by the glasses, looked straight into his own, and at this very second that other personality in Jones, the one that was ever watching, rose up swiftly from the depths within and held a mirror to his face. A moment of flame and vision rushed over him, and for one single second, one merciless second of clear sight, he saw the manager as the tall dark man of his evil dreams, and the knowledge that he had suffered at his hands some awful injury in the past crashed through his mind like the report of a cannon. It all flashed upon him and was gone, changing him from fire to ice and then back again to fire, and he left the office with the certain conviction in his heart that the time for his final settlement with the man, the time for the inevitable retribution, was at last drawing very near. According to his invariable custom, however, he succeeded in putting the memory of all this unpleasantness out of his mind with the changing of his office coat, and after dozing a little in his leather chair before the fire, he started out, as usual, for dinner in the Soho French restaurant, and began to dream himself away into the region of flowers and singing, and to commune with the invisibles that were the very sources of his real life and being. For it was in this way that his mind worked, and the habits of years had crystallized into rigid lines along which it was now necessary and inevitable for him to act. At the door of the little restaurant he stopped short, a half-remembered appointment in his mind, he had made an engagement with someone, but where, or with whom, had entirely slipped his memory. He thought it was for dinner, or else to meet just after dinner, and for a second it came back to him that it had something to do with the office. But 
whatever it was, he was quite unable to recall it, and a reference to his pocket engagement book showed only a blank page. Evidently, he had even omitted to enter it, and after standing a moment vainly trying to recall either the time, place, or person, he went in and sat down. But though the details had escaped him, his subconscious memory seemed to know all about it, for he experienced a sudden sinking of the heart, accompanied by a sense of foreboding anticipation, and felt that beneath his exhaustion there lay a centre of tremendous excitement. The emotion caused by the engagement was at work, and would presently cause the actual details of the appointment to reappear. Inside the restaurant the feeling increased instead of passing. Someone was waiting for him somewhere. Someone whom he had definitely arranged to meet. He was expected by a person that very night and just about that very time. But by whom? Where? A curious inner trembling came over him, and he made a strong effort to hold himself in hand and to be ready for anything that might come and then suddenly came the knowledge that the place of appointment was this very restaurant, and, further, that the person he had promised to meet was already here, waiting somewhere quite close beside him. He looked up nervously and began to examine the faces round him. The majority of the diners were Frenchmen, chattering loudly with much gesticulation and laughter, and there was a fair sprinkling of clerks like himself, who came because the prices were low and the food good, but there was no single face that he recognised, until his glance fell upon the occupant of the corner seat opposite, generally filled by himself. There's the man who's waiting for me, thought Jones instantly. He knew it at once. The man, he saw, was sitting well back into the corner, with a thick overcoat buttoned tightly up to the chin. His skin was very white, and a heavy black beard grew far up over his cheeks. At first the secretary took him for a stranger, but when he looked up and their eyes met, a sense of familiarity flashed across him, and for a second or two Jones imagined he was staring at a man he had known years before. For barring the beard it was the face of an elderly clerk who had occupied the next desk to his own when he first entered the service of the insurance company, and had shown him the most painstaking kindness and sympathy in the early difficulties of his work. But a moment later the illusion passed, for he remembered that Thorpe had been dead at least five years. The similarity of the eyes was obviously a mere suggestive trick of memory. The two men stared at one another for several seconds, and then Jones began to act instinctively, and because he had to. He crossed over and took the vacant seat at the other's table facing him, for he felt it was somehow imperative to explain why he was late, and how it was he had almost forgotten the engagement altogether. No honest excuse, however, came to his assistance, though his mind had begun to work furiously. Yes, you are late, said the man quietly, before he could find a single word to utter. But it doesn't matter. Also, you had forgotten the appointment, but that makes no difference either. I knew that there was an engagement, Jones stammered, passing his hand over his forehead. But somehow... You will recall it presently, continued the other in a gentle voice, and smiling a little. It was in deep sleep last night we arranged this, and the unpleasant occurrences of today have for the moment, obliterated it. A faint memory stirred within him as the man spoke, and a grove of trees with moving forms hovered before his eyes and then vanished again, while for an instant the stranger seemed to be capable of self-distortion and to have assumed vast proportions with wonderful flaming eyes. Oh, he gasped, it was there, in the other region. Of course said the other, with a smile that illuminated his whole face. You will remember presently, all in good time, and meanwhile you have no cause to feel afraid. There was a wonderful soothing quality in the man's voice, like the whispering of a great wind, and the clerk felt calmer at once. They sat a little while longer, 
but he could not remember that they talked much or ate anything. He only recalled afterwards that the head waiter came up and whispered something in his ear, and that he glanced round and saw the other people were looking at him curiously, some of them laughing, and that his companion then got up and led the way out of the restaurant. They walked hurriedly through the streets, neither of them speaking, and Jones was so intent upon getting back the whole history of the affair from the region of deep sleep that he barely noticed the way they took. Yet it was clear he knew where they were bound, or just as well as his companion, for he crossed the streets often ahead of him, diving down alleys without hesitation, and the other followed always without correction. The pavements were very full, and the usual night crowds of London were surging to and fro in the glare of the shop lights, but somehow no one impeded their rapid movements, and they seemed to pass through the people as if they were smoke and as they went the pedestrians and traffic grew less and less, and they soon passed the mansion house and the deserted space in front of the Royal Exchange, and so on, down Fenchurch Street, and within sight of the Tower of London, rising dim and shadowy in the smoky air. Jones remembered all this perfectly well, and thought it was his intense preoccupation that made the distance seem so short, but it was when the Tower was left behind and they turned northwards, that he began to notice how altered everything was, and saw that they were in a neighbourhood where houses were suddenly scarce, and lanes and fields beginning, and that their only light was the stars overhead. And as the deeper consciousness more and more asserted itself to the exclusion of the surface happenings of his mere body during the day, the sense of exhaustion vanished and he realised that he was moving somewhere in the region of causes behind the veil, beyond the gross deceptions of the senses, and released from the clumsy spell of space and time. Without great surprise, therefore, he turned and saw that his companion had altered, had shed his overcoat and black hat, and was moving beside him absolutely without sound. For a brief second he saw him tall as a tree, extending through space like a great shadow, misty and wavering of outline, followed by a sound like wings in the darkness. But when he stopped, fear clutching at his heart, the other resumed his former proportions, and Jones could plainly see his normal outline against the green field behind. Then the secretary saw him fumbling at his neck, and at the same moment the black beard came away from the face in his hand. Then you are Thorpe, he gasped, yet somehow without overwhelming surprise. They stood facing one another in the lonely lane, trees meeting overhead and hiding the stars, and a sound of mournful sighing among the branches. I am Thorpe, was the answer, in a voice that almost seemed part of the wind. And I have come out of our past to help you, for my debt to you is large, and in this life I had but small opportunity to repay. Jones thought quickly of the man's kindnesses to him in the office, and a great wave of feeling surged through him as he began to remember dimly the friend by whose side he had already climbed, perhaps through vast ages of his soul's evolution. To help me now, he whispered. You will understand me when you enter into your real memory and recall how great a debt I have to pay for old faithful kindnesses of long ago, sighed the other in a voice like falling wind. Between us, though, there can be no question of debt, Jones heard himself saying, and remembered the reply that floated to him on the air, and the smile that lightened for a moment the stern eyes facing him. Not of debt, indeed, but of privilege. Jones felt his heart leap out towards this man, this old friend, tried by centuries and still faithful. He made a movement to seize his hand, but the other shifted like a thing of mist, and for a moment the clerk's head swam and his eyes seemed to fail. Then you are dead, he said under his breath with a slight shiver. Five years ago 
I left the body you knew, replied Thorpe. I tried to help you then instinctively, not fully recognizing you, but now I can accomplish far more. With an awful sense of foreboding and dread in his heart, the secretary was beginning to understand. It has to do with... with... Your past dealings with the manager. As the wind rose louder among the branches overhead and carried the remainder of the sentence into the air, Jones's memory, which was just beginning to stir among the deepest layers of all, shut down suddenly with a snap and he followed his companion over fields and down sweet-smelling lanes, where the air was fragrant and cool, till they came to a large house, standing gaunt and lonely in the shadows at the edge of a wood. It was wrapped in utter stillness, with the windows heavily draped in black, and the clerk, as he looked, felt such an overpowering wave of sadness invade him that his eyes began to burn and smart and he was conscious of a desire to shed tears. The key made a harsh noise as it turned in the lock, and when the door swung open into a lofty hall, they heard a confused sound of rustling and whispering, as of a great throng of people pressing forward to meet them. The air seemed full of swaying movement, and Jones was certain he saw hands held aloft and dim faces claiming recognition, while in his heart already oppressed by the approaching burden of vast accumulated memories, he was aware of the uncoiling of something that had been asleep for ages. As they advanced, he heard the doors close with a muffled thunder behind them, and saw that the shadows seemed to retreat and shrink away towards the interior of the house, carrying the hands and faces with them. He heard the wind singing round the walls and over the roof, and its wailing voice mingled with the sound of deep collective breathing that filled the house like the murmur of a sea. And as they walked up the broad staircase and through the vaulted rooms where pillars rose like the stems of trees, he knew that the building was crowded row upon row with the thronging memories of his own long past. This is the house of the past, whispered Thorpe beside him, as they moved silently from room to room. The house of your past, it is full from cellar to roof, with the memories of what you have done, thought, and felt, from the earliest stages of your evolution until now. The house climbs up almost to the clouds, and stretches back into the heart of the wood you saw outside. But the remoter halls are filled with the ghosts of ages ago, too many to count, and even if we were able to waken them, you could not remember them now. Some day, though, they will come and claim you, and you must know them and answer their questions for they can never rest till they have exhausted themselves again through you, and justice has been perfectly worked out. But now follow me closely, and you shall see the particular memory for which I am permitted to be your guide, so that you may know and understand a great force in your present life and may use the sword of justice, or rise to the level of a great forgiveness, according to your degree of power. Icy thrills ran through the trembling clerk, and as he walked slowly beside his companion, he heard from the vaults below, as well as from more distant regions of the vast building, the stirrings and sighing of the serried ranks of sleepers, sounding in the still air like a chord swept from unseen strings stretched somewhere among the very foundations of the house. Stealthily, picking their way among the great pillars, they moved up the sweeping staircase and through several dark corridors and halls, and presently stopped outside a small door in an archway where the shadows were very deep. Remain close by my side, and remember to utter 
No cry, whispered the voice of his guide, and as the clerk turned to reply, he saw his face was stern to whiteness, and even shone a little in the darkness. The room they entered seemed at first to be pitchy black, but gradually the secretary perceived a faint reddish glow against the farther end, and thought he saw figures moving silently to and fro. Now watch, whispered Thorpe, as they pressed close to the wall near the door and waited. But remember to keep absolute silence. It is a torture scene. Jones felt utterly afraid, and would have turned to fly if he dared, for an indescribable terror seized him, and his knees shook, but some power that made escape impossible held him remorselessly there, and with eyes glued upon the spots of light he crouched against the wall and waited. The figures began to move more swiftly, each in its own dim light that shed no radiance beyond itself, and he heard a soft clanking of chains, and the voice of a man groaning in pain. Then came the sound of a door closing, and thereafter Jones saw but one figure, the figure of an old man, naked entirely, and fastened with chains to an iron framework on the floor. His memory gave a sudden leap of fear as he looked, for the features and white beard were familiar, and he recalled them as though of yesterday. The other figures had disappeared, and the old man became the centre of the terrible picture. Slowly, with ghastly groans, as the heat below him increased to a steady glow, the aged body rose in a curve of agony, resting upon the iron frame, only where the chains held wrists and ankles fast. Cries and gasps filled the air, and Jones felt exactly as though they came from his own throat, and as if the chains were burning into his own wrists and ankles and the heat scorching the skin and flesh upon his own back, he began to writhe and twist himself. Spain, whispered the voice at his side, and four hundred years ago. And the purpose, gasped the perspiring clerk, though he knew quite well what the answer must be. To extort the name of a friend to his death and betrayal came the reply through the darkness. A sliding panel opened with a little rattle in the wall immediately above the rack, and a face framed in the same red glow appeared and looked down upon the dying victim. Jones was only just able to choke a scream, for he recognized the tall, dark man of his dreams. With horrible, gloating eyes he gazed down upon the writhing form of the old man, and his lips moved as in speaking though no words were actually audible. He asks again for the name, explained the other, as the clerk struggled with the intense hatred and loathing that threatened every moment to result in screams and action. His ankles and wrists pained him so that he could scarcely keep still, but a merciless power held him to the scene. He saw the old man, with a fierce cry, raise his tortured head and spit up into the face at the panel and then the shutter slid back again, and a moment later the increased glow beneath the body, accompanied by awful writhing, told of the application of further heat. There came the odour of burning flesh. The white beard curled and burned to a crisp. The body fell back limp upon the red-hot iron, and then shot up again in fresh agony. Cry after cry, the most awful in the world, rang out with deadened sound between the four walls, and again the panel slid back creaking, and revealed the dreadful face of the torturer. Again the name was asked for, and again it was refused, and this time, after the closing of the panel, a door opened, and the tall, thin man with the evil face came slowly into the chamber. His features were savage with rage and disappointment, and in the dull red glow that fell upon them he looked like a very prince of devils. In his hands he held a pointed iron at white heat. Now the murder! came from Thorpe, in a whisper that sounded as if it was outside the building and far away. Jones knew quite well what was coming, but was unable even to close his eyes. 
He felt all the fearful pains himself, just as though he were actually the sufferer. But now, as he stared, he felt something more besides. And when the tall man deliberately approached the rack and plunged the heated iron first into one eye and then into the other, he heard the faint fizzing of it and felt his own eyes burst in frightful pain from his head. At the same moment, unable longer to control himself, he uttered a wild shriek and dashed forward to seize the torturer and tear him into a thousand pieces. Instantly, in a flash, the entire scene vanished. Darkness rushed in to fill the room, and he felt himself lifted off his feet by some force like a great wind and borne swiftly away into space. When he recovered his senses... He was standing just outside the house, and the figure of Thorpe was beside him in the gloom. The great doors were in the act of closing behind him, but before they shut, he fancied he caught a glimpse of an immense veiled figure standing upon the threshold with flaming eyes, and in his hand a bright weapon like a shining sword of fire. Come quickly now, all is over, Thorpe whispered. "'And the dark man?' gasped the clerk as he moved swiftly by the other's side. "'In this present life is the manager of the company.' "'And the victim?' "'Was yourself.' "'And the friend he, I, refused to betray?' "'I was that friend.' answered Thorpe, his voice with every moment sounding more and more like the cry of the wind. You gave your life in agony to save mine. And again in this life we have all three been together. Yes, such forces are not soon or easily exhausted. And justice is not satisfied till all have reaped what they sowed. Jones had an odd feeling that he was slipping away into some other state of consciousness. Thorpe began to seem unreal. Presently he would be unable to ask more questions. He felt utterly sick and faint with it all, and his strength was ebbing. Oh, quick, he cried. Now tell me more. Why did I see this? What must I do? The wind swept across the field on their right and entered the wood beyond with a great roar, and the air round him seemed filled with voices and a rushing of hurried movement. To the ends of justice, answered the other, as though speaking out of the centre of the wind and from a distance, which is sometimes entrusted to the hands of those who suffered and were strong. One wrong cannot be put right by another wrong, but your life has been so worthy that the opportunity is given to... The voice grew fainter and fainter. Already it was far overhead with the rushing wind. You may punish all. Here Jones lost sight of Thorpe's figure altogether, for he seemed to have vanished and melted away into the wood behind him. His voice sounded far across the trees, very weak and ever rising. Or if you can rise to the level of a great forgiveness. The voice became inaudible. The wind came crying out of the wood again. Jones shivered and stared about him. He shook himself violently and rubbed his eyes. The room was dark. The fire was out. He felt cold and stiff. He got up out of his armchair, still trembling, and lit the gas. Outside the wind was howling, and when he looked at his watch, he saw that it was very late, and he must go to bed. He had not even changed his office coat. He must have fallen asleep in the chair as soon as he came in, and he had slept for several hours. Next day and for several weeks thereafter the business of the office went on as usual, 
and Jones did his work well and behaved outwardly with perfect propriety. No more visions troubled him, and his relations with the manager became, if anything, somewhat smoother and easier. True, the man looked a little different, because the clerk kept seeing him with his inner and outer eye promiscuously, so that one moment he was broad and red-faced, and the next he was tall, thin, and dark enveloped, as it were, in a sort of black atmosphere tinged with red, while at times a confusion of the two sights took place, and Jones saw the two faces mingled in a composite countenance that was very horrible indeed to contemplate. But beyond this occasional change in the outward appearance of the manager, there was nothing that the secretary noticed as the result of his vision, and business went on more or less as before, and perhaps even with a little less friction. But in the rooms under the roof in Bloomsbury, it was different, for there it was perfectly clear to Jones that Thorpe had come to take up his abode with him. He never saw him, but he knew all the time he was there. Every night on returning from his work he was greeted by the well-known whisper, Be ready when I give the sigh. And often in the night he woke up suddenly out of deep sleep, and was aware that Thorpe, had that minute moved away from his bed, and was standing, waiting and watching, somewhere in the darkness of the room. Often he followed him down the stairs, though the dim gas-jet on the landings never revealed his outline, and sometimes he did not come into the room at all, but hovered outside the window, peering through the dirty panes, or sending his whisper into the chamber in the whistling of the wind. For Thorpe had come to stay, and Jones knew that he would not get rid of him until he had fulfilled the ends of justice and accomplished the purpose for which he was waiting. Meanwhile, as the days passed, he went through a tremendous struggle with himself and came to the perfectly honest decision that the level of great forgiveness was impossible for him and that he must, therefore, accept the alternative and use the secret knowledge placed in his hands, and execute justice. And once this decision was arrived at, he noticed that Thorpe no longer left him alone during the day as before, but now accompanied him to the office, and stayed more or less at his side all through business hours as well. His whisper made itself heard in the streets and in the train, and even in the manager's room where he worked, sometimes warning, sometimes urging but never for a moment suggesting the abandonment of the main purpose, and more than once so plainly audible that the clerk felt certain others must have heard it as well as himself. The obsession was complete. He felt he was always under Thorpe's eye day and night, and he knew he must acquit himself like a man when the moment came, or prove a failure in his own sight as well as in the sight of the other. And now that his mind was made up, nothing could prevent the carrying out of the sentence. He bought a pistol, and spent his Saturday afternoons practising at a target in lonely places along the Essex shore, marking out in the sand the exact measurements of the manager's room. Sundays he occupied in like fashion, putting up at an inn overnight for the purpose, spending the money that usually went into the savings bank on travelling expenses and cartridges. Everything was done very thoroughly, for there must be no possibility of failure, and at the end of several weeks he had become so expert with his six-shooter that at a distance of twenty-five feet, which was the greatest length of the manager's room, he could pick the inside out of a halfpenny nine times out of a dozen, and leave a clean, unbroken rim. There was not the slightest desire to delay. He had thought the matter over from every point of view his mind could reach, and his purpose was inflexible. Indeed, he felt proud to think that he had been chosen as the instrument of justice in the infliction of so well-deserved and so terrible a punishment. Vengeance may have had some part in his decision, but he could not help that, for he still felt at times the hot chains burning his wrists and ankles with fierce agony through to the bone. 
He remembered the hideous pain of his slowly roasting back and the point when he thought death must intervene to end his suffering. But instead, new powers of endurance had surged up in him and awful further stretches of pain had opened up and unconsciousness seemed farther off than ever. Then at last the hot irons in his eyes, it all came back to him and caused him to break out in icy perspiration at the mere thought of it. The vile face at the panel, the expression of the dark face. His fingers worked, his blood boiled. It was utterly impossible to keep the idea of vengeance altogether out of his mind. Several times he was temporarily balked of his prey. Odd things happened to stop him when he was on the point of action. The first day, for instance, the manager fainted from the heat. Another time, when he had decided to do the deed, the manager did not come down to the office at all. And a third time, when his hand was actually in his hip pocket, he suddenly heard Thorpe's horrid whisper telling him to wait and turning, he saw that the head cashier had entered the room noiselessly without his noticing it. Thorpe evidently knew what he was about, and did not intend to let the clerk bungle the matter. He fancied, moreover, that the head cashier was watching him. He was always meeting him in unexpected corners and places, and the cashier never seemed to have an adequate excuse for being there. His movements seemed suddenly of particular interest to others in the office as well. The clerks were always being sent to ask him unnecessary questions, and there was apparently a general design to keep him under a sort of surveillance, so that he was never much alone with the manager in the private room where they worked. And once the cashier had even gone so far as to suggest that he could take his holiday earlier than usual, if he liked as the work had been very arduous of late, and the heat exceedingly trying. He noticed, too, that he was sometimes followed by a certain individual in the streets, a careless-looking sort of man who never came face to face with him, or actually ran into him, but who was always in his train or omnibus, and whose eye he often caught observing him over the top of his newspaper and who on one occasion was even waiting at the door of his lodgings when he came out to dine. There were other indications, too, of various sorts, that led him to think something was at work to defeat his purpose, and that he must act at once before these hostile forces could prevent. And so the end came very swiftly, and was thoroughly approved by Thorpe. It was towards the close of July, and one of the hottest days London had ever known, for the city was like an oven, and the particles of dust seemed to burn the throats of the unfortunate toilers in street and office. The portly manager, who suffered cruelly, owing to his size, came down perspiring and gasping with the heat. He carried a light-coloured umbrella to protect his head. He'll want something more than that, though, Jones laughed quietly to himself when he saw him enter. The pistol was safely in his hip pocket, every one of its six chambers loaded. The manager saw the smile on his face and gave him a long, steady look as he sat down to his desk in the corner. A few minutes later he touched the bell for the head cashier, a single ring, and then asked Jones to fetch some papers from another safe in the room upstairs. A deep inner trembling seized the secretary as he noticed these precautions for he saw that the hostile forces were at work against him, and yet he felt he could delay no longer and must act that very morning, interference or no interference. However, he went obediently up in the lift to the next floor, and while fumbling with the combination of the safe, known only to himself, the cashier and the manager, he heard again Thorpe's horrid whisper just behind him. You must do it today. You must do it. Today, He came down again with the papers and found the manager alone. The room was like a furnace, and a wave of dead heated air met him in the face as he went in. The moment he passed the doorway he realized that he had been the subject of conversation between the head cashier and his enemy. They had been discussing him. 
Perhaps an inkling of his secret had somehow got into their minds. They had been watching him for days past. They had become suspicious. Clearly he must act now, or let the opportunity slip by, perhaps forever. He heard Thorpe's voice in his ear, but this time it was no mere whisper, but a plain human voice speaking out loud. Now, it said, do it now. The room was empty. Only the manager and himself were in it. Jones turned from his desk where he had been standing and locked the door leading into the main office. He saw the army of clerks scribbling in their shirt sleeves, for the upper half of the door was of glass. He had perfect control of himself, and his heart was beating steadily. The manager, hearing the key turn in the lock, looked up sharply. What's that you're doing? he asked quickly. Only locking the door, sir, replied the secretary in a quite even voice. Why, who told you to? The voice of justice, sir, replied Jones, looking steadily into the hated face. The manager looked black for a moment, and stared angrily across the room at him. Then suddenly his expression changed as he stared, and he tried to smile. It was meant to be a kind of smile, evidently, but it only succeeded in being frightened. That is a good idea in this weather, he said lightly but it would be much better to lock it on the outside, wouldn't it, Mr. Jones? I think not, sir. You might escape me then. Now you can't. Jones took his pistol out and pointed it at the other's face. Down the barrel he saw the features of the tall, dark man, evil and sinister. Then the outline trembled a little, and the face of the manager slipped back into its place. It was white as death and shining with perspiration. You tortured me to death four hundred years ago, said the clerk in the same steady voice, and now the dispensers of justice have chosen me to punish you. The manager's face turned to flame and then back to chalk again. He made a quick movement towards the telephone bell, stretching out a hand to reach it, but at the same moment Jones pulled the trigger, and the wrist was shattered, splashing the wall behind with blood. That's one place where the chains burnt, he said quietly to himself. His hand was absolutely steady, and he felt that he was a hero. The manager was on his feet with a scream of pain, supporting himself with his right hand on the desk in front of him. But Jones pressed the trigger again, and a bullet flew into the other wrist, so that the big man, deprived of support, fell forward with a crash onto the desk. You damn madman! shrieked the manager. Drop that pistol! That's another place, was all Jones said, still taking careful aim for another shot. The big man, screaming and blundering, scrambled beneath the desk, making frantic efforts to hide. But the secretary took a step forward and fired two shots in quick succession into his projecting legs, hitting first one ankle and then the other, and smashing them horribly. Two more places where the chains burnt, he said, going a little nearer. The manager, still shrieking, tried desperately to squeeze his bulk behind the shelter of the opening beneath the desk. But he was far too large, and his bald head protruded through on the other side. Jones caught him by the scruff of his great neck and dragged him yelping out onto the carpet. He was covered with blood and flopped helplessly upon his broken wrists. Be quick now, cried the voice of Thorpe. There was a tremendous commotion and banging at the door, and Jones gripped his pistol tightly. Something seemed to crash through his brain, clearing it for a second, so that he thought he saw beside him a great veiled figure with drawn sword and flaming eyes and sternly approving attitude. Remember the eyes! Remember the eyes! His thought in the air above him. Jones felt like a god with a god's power. Vengeance disappeared from his mind. He was acting impersonally as an instrument in the hands of the invisibles who dispense justice and balance accounts. He bent down and put the barrel close into the other's face, smiling a little as he saw the childish efforts of the arms to cover his head. Then he pulled the trigger, and a bullet went straight into the right eye. 
blackening the skin. Moving the pistol two inches the other way, he sent another bullet crashing into the left eye. Then he stood upright over his victim with a deep sigh of satisfaction. The manager wriggled convulsively for the space of a single second, and then lay still in death. There was not a moment to lose, for the door was already broken in, and violent hands were at his neck. Jones put the pistol to his temple, and once more pressed the trigger with his finger. But this time there was no report. Only a little dead click answered the pressure, for the secretary had forgotten that his pistol had only six chambers, and that he had used them all. He threw the useless weapon on to the floor, laughing a little out loud, and turned, without a struggle, to give himself up. I had to do it, he said quietly, while they tied him up. It was simply my duty, and now I am ready to face the consequences, and Thorpe will be proud of me, for justice has been done, and the gods are satisfied. He made not the slightest resistance, and when the two policemen marched him off through the crowd of shuddering little clerks in the office, he again saw the veiled figure moving majestically in front of him, making slow, sweeping circles with the flaming sword to keep back the host of faces that were thronging in upon him from the other region. End of The Insanity of Jones A Study in Reincarnation by Algernon Blackwood Recording by Andy Sames